last week on Investigates. Not safe. It's not a safe environment. There's incidents just about every day and we're just wondering when they're going to uh, have another home invasion or other incidents. Someone has to kind of speak uh, on, on their behalf sometimes, eh? I was there for three hours with tenants, hearing about the litany of issues. 90% of those issues should be dealt with by a typical management firm who is taking the money of tenants. That's just typical. And security can only be as good as the tenants that live there. When I see security there. Part of what that Free Press article did expose is, uh, you know, some of the opportunities that were there. And so that obviously has given us an opportunity to work more closely with, uh, with the agencies that, uh, that support us, the Indigenous agencies that support us. They feel like, you know, what's wrong with me? Or why are they treating me like this? It seems like there's nothing there to um, lift their spirits up, you know? Yeah. Nothing to make them feel better. They're not making the residents' life first. It should be first and foremost. The staff that live there, that work there, are there to make the elders' lives the best possible life there is. Long-term care of Indigenous elders in Canada appears to be a sensitive subject. No one wants to be identified when they speak out. Why? And the sad thing is a lot of elders are scared to ask for help. They're scared to say something and um, because they're, they're, they're scared they'll be kicked out. They're absolutely petrified to say things. And, and that's from their upbringing. Like they were, a lot of them were taught to, you know, just don't say anything. And... These two women have relatives at the Rod McGillivray Memorial Care Home, six hours north of Winnipeg in a Pasquayak Cree nation. We have no idea what goes on in there. There's been rarely any communication. We are calling this woman Joan. Her mother has lived there for more than five years. Home care through OCN is uh, very sporadic, and her partner couldn't look after her, and she ended up having to go to the care home. And that is where she always said she wanted to go because of her heritage. We don't have the facilities at home to even to uh, adjust whatever to renovate her, her needs. And um, that's where she wanted to go to because, you know, friends and relatives were there. The Rod McGillivray Care Home is run by the Opasquayak Cree Nation. It was set up as a 28 bed facility with two special care unit beds. With so many Indigenous people forced to travel out of the community for care, the goal of the care home was to address long-term care needs on reserve. But for this woman, who we are calling Mary, there have been issues. I've heard uh, from my parent that there's so many days in between before they get another bath or, you know, and families are tasked with the translation work from English to the Cree language. A lot of them don't speak English, and a lot of them have, you know, their English isn't very good, so it's hard for them to express exactly what they're feeling. So they have this person that does not speak Cree whatsoever talking to them, and they're trying to explain to them too what their problem is. 
you need to translate so that they understand what what the doctor is saying to them. They have spoken to staff at a Pasquayak Cree Nation Health, but they say that hasn't helped. We're not made to feel welcome there. Um, it, it just feels like everything needs to be hidden. And when we go there, when we ask questions, when we, you know, about our parents' care, where I've seen other people ask questions about their family care, and they're, they're brushed off and they're, they're made to feel like they don't belong there. You don't get nothing. It's a big runaround. You follow all protocols, all the people involved, step by step, and there's nothing done. Hello, Brittany speaking. We tried to get a comment from Opasquayak Cree Nation for weeks, but they did not grant us an interview. I'm here today to advise the community that we had a first positive case of COVID-19 in the community. We just don't know uh, how, how bad it is. A hundred million to deal with a pandemic with First Nations that are already stretched uh, is not going to go very far. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, things got much worse. You watch on TV and in other places where they've brought the the army in and all of a sudden they're having to bring it in here. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh my goodness, what's going on? And then why did everybody get so sick so fast? Joan knew her relative needed to be tested for the virus. There's something wrong when you're speaking to them. You know your, you know your family member. You know there's changes. It's like knowing if your kid is sick or not. And they're not, they're not listening to you. And that was when the COVID outbreak happened. You know, and you get a phone call. You did. I did get a phone call that one one staff member was infected, but the next thing you know, everybody was. Residents of the care home were allowed outdoor visits over the summer of 2020. We were supposed to visit outside on the patios, that was the only place we could visit. And so all the residents are out there and family members and the tables are filthy. Nobody's coming to clean them. The garbage cans are overflowing. Food stains, yeah. coffee stains. So it would, I would bring my own wipes and clean the area and where we were sitting and... All 28 residents and 14 staff members came down with the deadly virus in November 2020. Two died. On November 13th, Chief Christian Sinclair issued an emergency statement online. The outbreak in the care home is occurring in the context of widespread community transmission in the province, including our district, OCN, the PAW, and the RM of Kelsey. It is absolutely imperative that we now do everything we can to interrupt transmission of COVID-19 within our community. We are in full support of the full lockdown, effective immediately, and the need for everyone to follow the public health orders under the red critical level on the pandemic response system. The Canadian Armed Forces arrived to help six days after Sinclair's announcement. Coming up after the break. I've heard uh, from my parents that there's so many days in between before they get another dog. It's 2021. We need to get our act together in Canada to make sure that all elders, I don't care where they live, are being looked after properly. That's the bottom line. Personal care homes have been ground zero for the pandemic. COVID-19 ripped the proverbial band-aid off and laid bare all the issues within long-term care. 
the province of Manitoba doesn't oversee the Rod McGillivray Care Home. According to the province of Manitoba, the Opaskwayak Care Home doesn't fall under their jurisdiction and isn't required to fill out inspection reports. A provincial spokesperson told APTN Investigates there are only two on-reserve licensed personal care homes in Manitoba. Within their, within the funding For University of Saskatchewan professor Bonita Beatty, the emergency in long-term care has been going on for decades. Uh, Indigenous Services Canada has, has yet to look at facilities with, uh, aside from, um, um, you know, uh, having their housing policies, but looking at, at, at medical facilities and also um, long-term care facilities so that they're properly maintained and there's operational funding available there because that's been the problem. In 2018, BD provided statements to the Standing Committee on Indigenous and Northern Affairs. It profiled the need to look at First Nations long-term care issues in reserves across Canada because it was, it was focused on, on reserve programming at, at that time. There were talks going on across uh, some pro uh, provinces that I know to move that, that agenda forward because it had been profiled. Um, but then COVID hit and then, um, you know, just addressing that. And I think now they're starting to come back and, and start to look at that because it's, it's really heightened. And in other words, it's illustrated and really starkly showed what has been happening for a long, long time, not just for, you know, First Nations seniors in long-term care homes, but in seniors in general. Professor Beatty has been working on long-term care for First Nations seniors for the last eight years. My background is, is a PhD in, in uh, political science from the U, U of A, and, uh, but it has to do with um, more on, on public services, um, research on governance and public services, um, and particularly with vulnerable populations. So, I've, so most of my stuff is on First Nations health, health governance and public services, so whether, um, you know, and dealing with vulnerable populations. Can you tell me what some of the, the biggest challenges are in administering long-term care for Indigenous people? Wow, I think it's the it's the uh, jurisdiction um, just navigating the rules. Jurisdiction is really about the authority that a health provider has. So if it's a provincial health provider, the provincial health, their their jurisdiction comes from provincial authority. If it's a if it's a health provider on a reserve, their their authority flows from federal jurisdiction, but it. But more deeply, I think it flows from the, 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 the treaties and it also flows from the, the indigenous rights of their indigenous rights. In Canada, there are 53 indigenous run long-term care facilities. Jan Lagueros is the head of the Long-Term and Continuing Care Association of Manitoba. She says long-term care has been chronically underfunded for years. So in Manitoba, our long-term care, and I'm talking specifically now about personal care homes, the funding for uh, personal care homes has been frozen for 15 years. It is a long-standing issue. And, you know, it does appear as though Canada is um, one of the countries who is the most um, negligent, if you will, as it relates to caring for uh, seniors. In fact, the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority reduced the operational budget of long-term care facilities by a quarter of a percent in 2017. In 2018, the province announced they would reduce the long-term care facility budget by $2.3 million. Personal care home residents were subjected to fee increases of 1 to 5 percent in August of 2020. And the strain is showing at the Rod McGillivray Care Home. The residents' families shared photos with us. Unstable bed support and spilled food. I've heard uh, from my parents that 
there's so many days in between before they get another bath or, you know, or their bed. Their bed I've okay. had to change beds there because the bed was soiled that she was on. Or they sit in their soiled clothing for periods at a time because they don't have enough staff. So, like, you know, where's the dignity there? When you can go into your parents' room and you can smell the urine smell or the bowel movement smells and, you know, and the commode is sitting there and you know it's been sitting there all day. You can go in the morning and you can go in the afternoon and they still haven't put it away. The Pasquayak Cree Nation did not grant us an interview. COVID-19 has taken its toll on long-term care facilities, and especially on frontline workers. Michelle Goronsky, president of the Manitoba Government and General Employees Union, explains. She said staff are always the first to be blamed in an underfunded system. When something doesn't go the way it should, well, whose fault is it? And again, if we look at, you know, stopping the jurisdiction fights, and let's put those differences aside and let's put health care first and foremost. For years, the First Nations folks, there's been their health care system, uh, there are the health care provided to them, seems to be a constant struggle between who's responsible for it, who should be providing the dollars to make sure that our elders and others um, do have the medical care and the health care that they deserve and that they, they should have, like, like every other Canadian, every other Manitoban but there seems to be a constant battle and a constant struggle over those funding dollars and who's responsible, whose jurisdiction it is, who's accountable for it. She says the time is now to make changes. It's 2021. We need to get our act together in Canada to make sure that all elders, I don't care where they live, are being looked after properly. That's the bottom line. Manitoba Minister of Health, Seniors and Active Living Heather Stephenson did not respond to interview requests. For Joan and Mary, they say the solution is simple. The problem is there is, um, there's no advocate for elders either in McGilvery Care Home or on the reserve. There's no advocate at all. We don't want them to be superhuman and try to pull things out of midair. We just want to see these people smile, be happy and not, not be so down. We have to respect the most vulnerable. And we also have to respect our elders, period. Whether they're vulnerable or not, you know, and, and but we tend to respect the ones that are that are that are not vulnerable and we need to respect the vulnerable. Winnipeg Free Press journalist Negan Sinclair says more needs to be done. These are our elders and these are our members of our community and these are the survivors from residential schools, arguably the most violent genocidal process in Canadian history. And to have them re-traumatized at this point in their life, I think, is a stain on all of us. Like, let's try caring about our elders, caring about our survivors. Let's try treating our elders and our survivors like human beings. Seniors advocate Norman Mead says there are solutions. I think paying respect uh, is really important. And I want to really kind of highlight this because when we talk about uh, looking after our elders, our elders, our, our Indigenous elders, you know, uh, we have to look after them in the best way we, we can, right? And it's, it's first by giving them a voice, or at least making sure they have a voice, right, that they're being heard. And, and, and the second thing is to make sure that the services that uh, are there that can make their life a little bit better, right? So I, I think an advocate's uh, office, from what I've seen in my work in government, uh, 
an advocate's uh, office would, uh, I think, would be would be a pretty key piece of, uh, 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 you know, information or a, a key agency uh, in in making that voice uh, heard. There's very, um, you know, um, astute and very, um, you know, um, very good leaders out there, good administrators out there, uh, with the, with the indigenous populations who know what to do, what their community needs. And I think those have to be listened to. And certainly the voices of the patients, the seniors, who are the seniors or the elders, their voices, I think, should be privileged above all. And the families, you know, because, you know, at the end of the day, that's who's going to provide the bulk of the service. For elders and their families, it all comes down to care. And we were always taught, even as a child, that you respect your elders. It just breaks my heart because as much as I hate to say it, this is their last walk in life. And and this is their last home. And, and they need to be treated with respect. Next week on Investigates. They continue to harass and invade us constantly, and they've never stopped. Don't point your gun at me! Please! Don't point, he's pointing his gun at me! You're scared, you're afraid. But when your people say, this is your duty, you do it. Am I afraid today? Yes. All I dreamed about was owning my own fishing boat. We had more boats in the harbor when I was growing up. Then we have in all the boats of Newtonus today. That's all 15 tribes. More in that one village in the 50s than we have today. We need some of the earth to be left alone. You don't have to take everything. And that's what we're doing. Our rights, our title, our jurisdiction, our authority we constantly remind, whether it's provincial or federal governments, that they only have assumed and presumed authority. The authority lies with the authority.